priest, his name was Porter William, and he made it a practice to visit the parish school um, one day a week. I can remember I was at, when I was in Catholic school and the priest would come over. Some of them were funny, we enjoyed them, and others, you know, we just shied away from them because we had one that was kind of mean, didn't we? It was mean. Anyway, this guy would go to the, over to the school one day a week and he walked into the fourth grade class where the children were studying the states and asked them how many states they could name. They came up with about 40 names. So Father William jokingly told them that in his day, students knew the names of all the states. One young man raised his head. He said, yeah, but in your day, there were only 13 of them. <laughs> I don't know if that's a true story. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. I know you will be familiar with this verse because this is a verse for today. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Dear Lord, this morning as we come before you, and we have lifted our voices together and, and praise and worship, and we just pray that you will that you will take these the, the morsels of this of this word, Lord, and um, it will come to the ears of the people who hear it. But I pray that it'll go to the into the spirit. And uh, that it will go where you want it to go, and then it will cause it to do what you need it to do, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So Amos chapter 9, 11 and 12 says this, In that day I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins, and will rebuild it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom, and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. And Jeremiah 14, 9 says, Why are you like a man taken by surprise, like a warrior, powerless to save? You are among us, Lord, and we bear your name. Do not forsake us. All people are not called by his name. If those who are called by my name, it says, but all people are not called by his name. The sense here is that those who are dedicated to him, people, in other words, of the living God, but not all are dedicated to him. As a matter of fact, the majority are not. Only those who have received him as Lord and Savior and living for God are called by the name Christian. Christians were first called that in Antioch, as you know. But we're talking about the, the, the birth of our nation today. Fourth of July, we celebrate the birth of this nation. And I wanted to talk about the patriots, the, the faith of the patriots, the original founders of this nation. And the founding of this nation is unlike any other that ever existed. You know, we're far removed now from the founding of the nation. It happened so long ago, and children aren't being taught the good of the founding of this nation anymore. They're being encouraged to look down at our early days. And, of course, this nation had evil in its beginning. Slavery is evil. Racism is evil. Mankind is generally evil, Romans 3.23. But the goodness of God was with the founding of this nation. The goodness of God was with the nation. This uh, comes from a site called Stand to Reason, where it says the phrase founding fathers is a proper noun. It refers to a very specific group of people. The 55 delegates to the Constitutional Convention. There were other important players like Jefferson and his thinking deeply influenced um, 
the shape of our nation, and we're not in attendance, but those 55 fathers of the nation make up the core. The denominational affiliation of these men is a matter of public record. Among the delegates, there were 28 Episcopalians, eight Presbyterians, seven Congregationalists, two Lutherans, two Dutch Reformed, two Methodists, two Roman Catholics, one unknown, and there were three what we call deists. And a deist is sort of like an agnostic. The three deists were Williamson, Wilson, and Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, a religious belief holding that God created the universe and established rationally comprehensible moral and natural laws, but does not interfere in human affairs through miracles and supernatural revelation. That is a theist. Um, this was at a time when church membership entailed a sworn public confession of biblical faith. Um, it's a very it's a very revealing tally. It means that members of the Constitutional Convention, which was the most influential group of men shaping the political foundation of our nation, were almost all Christian. 51 out of 55, 93% of them were Christian and had as their core doctrine a belief in Jesus. Most of them were Calvinist. As Presbyterians and Dutch Reform, they were Calvinist. And uh, considered by some to be the most extreme and, dog extreme and dogmatic form of Christianity, Thomas Jefferson said this. He said, no nation has ever yet existed or been governed without religion, nor can be. The Christian religion, this is what Thomas Jefferson said, and some people say he was a deist, but um, the Christian religion is the best religion that has ever been given to man, and as I, <clears throat> as chief magistrate of this, of this nation, am bound to give it the sanction of my example. So that was Thomas Jefferson, he understood as did most of the fathers, the founding fathers, that people cannot maintain liberty without religion. So I repeat, people cannot maintain liberty without religion. Now in our faith that we practice, we don't call it religion, we call it a relationship with God, it's not religion. Religion is trying to entice God's favor by doing certain things, in other words, works. But, uh, it's about grace and about faith. The very first act of Congress on September 7, 1774 was a prayer. Did you know that? The first act of Congress was a prayer. And what was that prayer? It was Psalm 35. And it was delivered by Reverend Duche, the rector of the Christ Church in Boston. That's the same church where on the 9th of April 8, 1775, Two lanterns would be hung in the belfry as a signal that the British were leaving Boston. If you know that, you know, they don't teach this stuff in school anymore, or do they? No, they don't. Well, I think they should. Amen. There's 28 verses in Psalm 35. I'm, on, I'm only reading here the first three. Contend, Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take up shield and armor. Arise and come to my aid. Brandish spear and javelin against those who pursue me. Say to me, I am your salvation. And that was Psalm 35, just part of it. And that was the first act of Congress. It was about God. George Washington. He followed the counsel of his mother. The proof is in a well-worn 24-page journal filled with prayers copied in his own handwriting that he titled Daily Sacrifice, 
The first entry was called Sunday morning, and it reads as follows. This was his prayer, and he wrote it down. Almighty God and most merciful Father, who did command the children of Israel to offer a daily sacrifice to thee, and thereby they might glorify and praise thee for thy protection both night and day. I beseech thee, my sins remove them from thy presence as far as the east is from the west and accept of me for the merits of thy son Jesus Christ. That was a handwritten prayer and just one out of a book of prayers that were written by George Washington. And he wrote this in his Sunday evening entry. This is his next prayer. Let me live according to these holy rules which thou hast this day prescribed in thy holy word. Direct me to the true subject, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Bless, O Lord, all the people of this land. George Washington, our first president, in addition to his faithfulness to pray, young Washington was also diligent about his reading scriptures, which he always kept near his bed. It was a lifelong practice. According to those close to him at Mount Vernon, he would get up at 4 a.m., spend an hour in his library kneeling before a chair, a candle on a stand next to it with an open Bible on the seat. Then again at 9 or 10 p.m., he would retire to the library for another hour of the same. He spent at least two hours a day in prayer and Bible study. George Washington. They won't tell you that in school. They won't tell you that anywhere. But it's true. All you have to do is do a little digging and you can find out what was in the hearts of the founding fathers of this nation. They were careful to use their Judeo-Christian ethical standards to form the principles under which we are to live. Thus we have had the greatest nation on earth. God will put favor on the nation that was formed in 1776. God looked with favor on the descendants of Abraham when he sent Joseph as a slave to Egypt. God looked with favor on the Israelites when he commissioned Moses to lead them out of the bondage of Egypt. God gave the commands that they were to follow inscribed by his own finger on two tablets of stone. God established the tribes in the land where he wanted them to be. This nation was established in a constitutional convention that followed Judeo-Christian principles. Our laws have mostly followed those principles. They're kind of drifting away from them lately, but there are times when those principles have been ignored, mostly lately. The Ten Commandments removed from courthouses and public places. 65 million babies killed before birth. Gay marriage making a mockery of the sanctity of marriage. And now children are being examined, encouraged to examine their feelings to, the, to, to decide if they're boys or girls. Feelings. There is no clinical test for that. There's no clinical test. But they're encouraged in school to examine their feelings to see if they're male or female. Genesis 5, 1 and 2. This is the written account of Adam's family line when God created mankind. He made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. And he named them mankind when they were created. The farther we drift away from godly intent of the founding fathers, the farther we drift as a nation from God. If you drift away from Judeo-Christian principles, you drift away from God. We're not only drifting from God, but we're on a collision course with God. The ungodly will 
not prevail. God is not mocked. It was miraculous that a ragtag bunch of colonies could defeat the most powerful military force of that day. It was miraculous. God will be with us as long as we're with him. Amen. Thank you. I was going to reach for my plaque right there. God's will revealed in Exodus chapter 20. It says, and God spoke these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Out of the land of slavery, you shall not have any other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Well, we went to a school where we bowed down, where they had us kneeling down in front of statues. And they're still doing it. And it's specific in the first part of the Ten Commandments. It's specific. It can't be interpreted any other way. Bow not thy knee before any graven image of anything in heaven, earth, or below. And then it says, you shall not misname the use, misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. We have to be careful about how we use the name of our God. Most are not. The minister says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreign residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And the next one is honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land and the Lord your, the, the Lord your God is giving you. And then you shall not murder I don't even have to say anything about that one. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servants, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. A coveting is something that happens in your heart. I wish I had that. And I, am. I wish I had what my neighbor has. That's a jealousy thing. We're not supposed to do that. Without going through all these one by one, you can see that this nation is no longer in God's will. The nation. People are, but the nation is not in God's will. Our country that we love is not in God's will. These commands are all being discarded disregarded, I should say. Some follow a couple of them, but this nation is out of the will of God. It was established in the will of God, but now it's out of the will of God. You and I are most likely in the will of God, but we're in a minority. As soon as a person decides that they're going to decide for themselves what's right and wrong, what their moral standard would be, then they're available to the wiles of Satan. And they are available to the prevailing values of those who think like them. And that's what happened to the nation Israel and later Judea. They decided for themselves. They decided wrong. Judgment came. 
first the northern ten tribes were taken away by Sennacherib in the in the uh, captivity of um, uh, it's an S word. I can't think of it. Anyway, that's what happened. And then, and then Judea was taken away by Nebuchadnezzar in the captivity of Babylon because they decided for themselves instead of doing what God had told them to do and not doing what He told them not to do. They decided instead they would do what the people around them did. And they started having idolatry and sacrificing babies in a fire. And there's a lot of it, a lot, a lot of references to specific times that they actually did that. And Asherah, I'm not even going to say what they were doing. We worship her, but it was disgusting. And they decided to do that, and he, and he allowed them to be taken away and destroyed. And this nation is doing the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For in him, Acts 17, 28, we live and move and have our being. In him, not in our own thoughts, our own attitudes, our own ideas. And it says, as, as some of your own poets have said we are his offspring. We need to keep that in mind all the time. Further in Proverbs chapter 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That's a big one. Trust in the Lord and lean not onto your own understanding. And he said, well, I think thus and such. Well, as soon as you say that, then you're, then you're drifting away. We want to know what God's will is and not impress upon him what our will is. In all your ways submit to him. All of our ways we're going to submit to God and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. That's what's wrong today. I don't know how we got this way. This nation was, was formed under the principles of their Judeo-Christian principles and now they're just throwing that stuff all away. They're wise in their own eyes. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. We love this country. Yes. You know, we, we wish for a nation to return to God. We wish. We need to stay faithful. We need to continue to pray for the nation. Miracles do happen. They do. We don't know what God's going to do with this nation or how long he's going to be. He's been very patient for a long, long time. We don't know if the nation's going to turn towards God. We can turn individual people towards God. When he comes back, you'll find people ready for his return. The nation, I don't know. I pray for it. But I, what I see is a, is, a, is a drifting away from God. And God is not mocked and he's not happy. And he's not pleased. But we have a nation that we still love and still pray for. Amen. Amen. If you stand with me, I just want us all to join together in prayer for this country. We want us all to do that. We celebrate the birth of the nation on 4th of July. And uh, I pray, pray this way every day. Lord, we do thank you for this church of, of people, Lord, who love you. Yes. And consider your will yes. as their guide. We live in a nation that once did that, Lord. Just as the nation Israel once did that, they decided to de to do things their own way and to think for themselves, and they were wrong. And this nation we live in, that we cherish and we love, is wrong because they're against God. They're against you, Lord. Well, we pray, Lord, that you would convict them. That you convict this nation and not destroy it, Lord. 
So we come against, Lord, those things that are against you. We come against Marxism and, and socialism. We come against this gender identity business in our schools. We come against the, the national coddling of, of gay marriage. We come against abortion, Lord. We come against the idea that we can just think for ourselves and do what we think is best without consulting the will of God. So we pray against all those things. What we pray for holiness to become important again. We pray for the nation to return Lord, to Judeo-Christian principles. We pray for the churches, Lord, to have more influence in society, even though they're looked down upon now. People think we're crazy. Well, we'll be crazy for you, Lord, all day long. We pray that you will help us, because we can't do any of this without your help, Lord. That you will help us, Lord, to win people to you. We pray for those in leadership, Lord. Those who seem to be far from you. There are, there's a remnant of people in leadership that aren't Christian. And, but there are so many that are so far. We pray for them, Lord. We pray for the ones that are believers. And we pray for the ones that are not, that they will become believers. We pray for the conviction of the Holy Spirit to come over this land for people to say, oh, we need to be following God instead of following our own whims. So we pray for a turnabout for this nation that we cherish and that we love. And we're helpless to do that, but you are not, Lord. So we just put it in your hands and we pray for it. For you to just reach this nation in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My friend has been good to be with.